All right, guys. Uh, hi, hello. I hope you're well today. Uh, what we're going to be talking about now is that now that uh, and JFK is gone and LBJ has taken over the country, uh, we're going to help fight in a war uh, thousands of miles away. So today, we're going to kind of move into that for now. We're going to discuss a little bit about what it was like for those guys as they we're going off to Vietnam to help the South Vietnamese fight in this civil conflict. Uh, we're going to discuss a little bit about what makes this fight so different to the fights that, uh, again, the parents of all of these soldiers had been fighting in for the most part. Uh, and then from there, we're going to discuss that because of how different this whole war is going to be that our strategies and the different uh, modes that we're going to kind of utilize are going to be just different. Uh, again, there are things that we'll talk about now and then a little bit later on as well. Uh, mid tomorrow, we'll kind of rewind a little bit and we'll talk about uh, basic training. So um, by the end of this, uh, again, one of the big understandings I need you to take away is not names of every battle or things like that, but I want you to understand what it was like for the men who, again, went off to fight in Vietnam, both willingly and unwillingly. So again, what was it like during training? And then what was it like during the war? And that's what we'll talk about a little bit today, uh, a little bit later on. And then once those guys were finished and they came home, what that was like as well. So uh, with that said and done, we're going to dive right in. So grab out your notes uh, and we're going to talk about fighting in the jungle. So in this fight, again, we're there to support the South Vietnamese. That's the whole idea uh, is that we're there helping the nationalists fight against the communist North. I med, but... Uh, well, we're going to be calling a lot of the shots. Uh, general William Westmoreland is the an American general who will be leading the combined fighting force of American and Vietnamese troops. The Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or ARVIN, as you're going to see in the notes going forward, uh, is the South Vietnamese Army. And, well... They're not well equipped to fight a large scale conflict, uh, but not anywhere near equi as equipped as us. That's why we end up taking the lead on a lot of this. Uh, they're really lacking in fighting ability. Not that they're resistant to fighting. Again, a lot of them support and they don't want to be communist, but uh, they just don't have the organization. And at this moment in time, Vietnam as a separate country from uh, outside rulers, they're like infants. They're very young. Uh, yes, they fought in wars before, but nothing quite like this. So like I said, we're going to be again giving them a lot of guidance, um, a lot of uh, help to try and fight. Uh, another thing that makes this conflict so very different is that we're fighting a different kind of enemy than we've had to fight in quite a while. Uh, and uh, what I mean by that is that the Viet Cong, or VC, as I'm going to call it, just again to lessen the amount of notes, basically, uh, the strategies that they utilized, well, <laughs> it made fighting in Vietnam even more difficult than regular fighting in a war. Okay, So the strategies that the VC relied on right, uh, is pretty classic guerrilla warfare, uh, hit and run, uh, ambush tactics, uh, again, basically like through their really, really keen understanding of the jungle terrain, and that is what Vietnam is, it's a lush tropical paradise if you were to go not in a wartime, and uh, they used their understanding of the landscape to basically move our troops around through various areas and they knew exactly where we were going to be. Uh, and it made it easy for them to be able to, again, create these really effective surprise attacks on us. Uh, again, one of the many descriptions of soldiers who went off and fight, fought in Vietnam is that there was never a moment of relaxation uh, because of the way that the VC fought so viciously and with such surprise. Uh, it made living on constant knife point on that edge of anything could happen at any time. You never know. Um, so that's something we're battling with. Another really big issue for the, us, again, fighting in Vietnam is the fact that the VC, 
look exactly like Arvin, <laughs> again, at least to us from the outside. Uh, we don't have enough familiarization with the Vietnamese people to be able to tell them apart. And because they could blend right back into the larger population, there was no way to tell who was working with them and who was working against them, if they were just innocent or if they were people who were helping and feeding them information. And this is another issue that we have to try and figure out how to work around, uh, again, as far as that stuff goes. Um, another, and something that the VC are going to use, oh man, so successfully against us, uh, is not only do they know the terrain above ground, they also utilize tunnel systems. This is a quite and infamous at this point strategy of the, again, the Viet Cong, the Vietnamese communists. Uh, and well, <laughs> these tunnels were built to last. They blended pretty seamlessly with the surroundings and they were complex. They were able to withstand airstrikes, remembering that our very first operation that we utilized against the Vietnamese communists at that point uh, were, were basically sustained bombing uh, and across large blankets of land. Uh, and it also helped them to be able to do sneak attacks, to be able to surprise us because they could pop up right out of the ground or they could uh, come in behind us because they they could we could they could tell when we walked across them so on and so forth uh, is really a very difficult difficult thing to try and fight against um, another strategy that the VC used which kept our guys on the ground in Vietnam constantly on edge uh, is the use of booby traps and landmines landmines scattered all across uh, and the VC would know where they are and we would not and of course if you step on a landmine there's no coming back from that if it is a sustained blast. Uh, so what we see here is that the VC is a an enemy who has been fighting like this in a scrappy, again, underdog way for years and years and years and years and years. And we, as an American fighting force, had become much more accustomed to, uh, again, the different types of battlefield fighting uh, through the First and Second World War, through our, even the conflict in Korea was much more typical in the way that we fought. And the guys who are being sent here are not... <laughs> The World War II vets for the most part. Uh, so they don't even have that to, to fall back on, that instinct or things like that. A lot of the people who are being sent to fight in Vietnam are the baby boomers. Uh, they're reaching that age now um, since uh, World War II is done, and they're the ones who are going to go and fight in the name of America, uh, helping the South Vietnamese to resist. Uh, so the next couple of slides are just to kind of reinforce how impressive and both impressive and terrifying uh, the tunnel systems that the VCs developed uh, overall. So I've got a handful of different slides. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about them with you in this video, but feel free to go back and look at them more closely. Uh, they're really impressive uh, how detailed they are as far as a diagram goes and all of the different things that the, again, VC managed to think about, like what it was that they were very clever and their ability to be able to live in these subterranean tunnels for, again, extended periods of time uh, and to use them uh, to fight against us. So hey, if you took all these pictures, what you would want to do is to put them all right next to each other. Uh, so this is the furthest to the left and then the next one will fit in right next to it, to the right, and then so on and so forth. Uh, but as you can see, uh, again, there's lots of different elements that are, again, focused here, you can, of course, see this idea of using bait. So having, uh, again, a VC agent up above ground, uh, and then we would see them and we would come and pursue them, uh, hoping that we would find the rest of their unit uh, or whatever it might be. But of course, they've got spider holes. Uh, spider holes, again, are basically like little you know, indents that would connect to the tunnels themselves, uh, where the VC would be able to hide themselves and they would pop up and be able to shoot out and then be able to get back underground into cover. Um, there's also a classic booby trap, again, right there, uh, which would be proved deadly if someone were to fall, again, overall into that. Uh, underneath, you can see there's various different, again, niches. Uh, these little niches where if somebody did make it down the hole, uh, they've got a booby trap up there that's got a hand grenade attached to it. There's an infirmary space. Um, you can see here that there's lots of different things 
going on uh, again where we the United States and Arvin would actually try and get into the holes uh, may and sometimes they were very small and small on purpose because the Vietnamese people in on average were a lot smaller so you couldn't take a lot with you down into the tunnels if you managed to go uh, there's various different places for supply for sleeping and so on and so forth uh, here you can see that there uh, is another <laughs> excuse me uh, another boot trap right there uh, weapons factory uh, you've got yourself a kitchen. Of course, having the vents for the smoke like that, again, is just misleading. Uh, you would assume that if smoke was coming up, that means there was someone there. But as you can see, there is no actual access to the tunnels from where that is uh, happening. Um, overall, <laughs> there is a place for water. Uh, this right here, again, is looking at if when we manage to get down into these tunnels, the sorts of things that we would have to contend with. Uh, of course, we've got ourselves our various different people uh, in these uh, blocked off areas, uh, booby traps set up, and how the fact that all of this is just, it's all very complex. Uh, my, you can see too that they've got things for being able to stay there. Another hospital, uh, we've got excuse me, a place for entertainment. Uh, and then this is kind of the furthest edge, uh, close to the water. Uh, again, this would be kind of like the headquarters uh, located with this uh, lovely tank underground. Uh, the idea here is that by hiding some of the larger scale items, it makes it harder for people to find them, of course. Uh, and the idea that they buried that underneath there is so intense. Um, and again, kind of utilized to be able to use all those various, the radio in it, things like that. Uh, it's defunct, but it still serves a purpose. So all of those various different elements, again, are so, whew, it's just so much, and it's very hard for us to contend with. So how is it that we, the United States, adjusted to fighting, and what was our approach? Uh, well, the first strategy was this, it, again, they called it the Battle of Attrition. And ultimately what the battle of attrition was all about was the strategy to kind of wear down the enemy through constant harassment uh, with modern weaponry. A lot of what we were bringing to the table was they were advanced as far as weapons goes, uh, but it, they weren't necessarily appropriate for the type of fighting that the VC were doing. Um, and every time we saw even can someone who might have, might not have been uh, part of the VC killed, we wanted those numbers. And the more we put those numbers out there, because this was a high casualty count war on both sides, uh, especially for the Vietnamese, because they did not, there was a very little regard for life, kind of similar to the Japanese in that instant, uh, that they were not going to just give up easily in any way. Uh, and we would publish the numbers, uh, hoping that it would just make the Vietnamese people again, they'd just get tired and they'd give up, uh, that they would be faced with the un overwhelming odds of beating and beating us back, uh, so on and so forth. Another piece of this was the battle for hearts and minds. And this is more or less a, a goodwill campaign. Uh, it's the attempt to try and get the peasant population where a lot of the communist influence had infiltrated was into the more rural parts of Vietnam. Um, and again, it was very complicated for us as a fighting force against the Vietnamese with the Viet, again, it's all very confusing for the people there and for us, um, unfortunately. We did not manage to win over many Vietnamese because we were found ourselves fighting a war that wasn't traditional. So it there were no real like big battle wins like you had in World War II that you could report back on where land was won or lost, or there was again the capturing of various different pieces. Everything felt very random uh, and scattered. So we had to adapt our weaponry uh, and our weaponry unfortunately had a negative impact, not just on the people we were trying to fight, but on everybody in Vietnam. So one of the probably most famous uh, elements of new weapons that we unleashed in the Vietnamese conflict is going to be napalm. Uh, napalm is a gasoline based bomb. Uh, I meant that it, when it explodes, uh, it sends gasoline, which burns for longer and is harder to control, uh, again, as far as it can go. Uh, so what ends up happening here is that we, the United States, and again, that's 
unfortunately, what ends up happening as these the years go on uh, is that this becomes much more a U.S. with a little bit of help from the South Vietnamese against the again, Vietnamese communists. Um, napalm bombs would set fire to huge swaths of the jungle. We're trying to uncover our enemy. Uh, but unfortunately, pe other people needed the jungle. Other people relied on the things that the jungle provided, uh, and we burnt them to the ground. Uh, another way, instead of just burning the jungle down, would be the use of Agent Orange. Uh, Agent Orange was a chemical, a uh, chemical co concoction that uh, killed leaves on contact. I uh, get the problem here that really hurt us in the long run is that it's toxic. <laughs> uh, and it doesn't just go away. Once it hits the ground, uh, it seeps into the ground and then into the groundwater reserves. It poisons the earth. And then anyone who is going to be drinking the water is going to be con ingesting this toxic uh, element. And uh, the other problem here is that when Agent Orange is dropped, it's like if you've ever seen uh, a crop duster when they're doing pesticides over a large swath of land, uh, if an innocent bystander happens to be underneath where the United States is are dropping Agent Orange, they would be covered in this toxic chemical. Uh, and it is, weirdly enough, not good for you. Uh, complications uh, attached to Agent Orange are still in being dealt with to this day. The last strategy that I'm going to talk about specifically that really hurts our reputation amongst the people of Vietnam are search and destroy missions. Uh, search and destroy was our response to the fact that we could not find our enemy. And when we did find them, they were usually attacking us and we couldn't do much else. Uh, so what a search and destroy mission entailed was that a platoon of soldiers would go into a village and they would basically take all of the villagers out, uh, especially if there was intelligence that said that someone was connected to the VC or they were passing information or they were agents of the VC. Uh, and we would basically, in attempts to find that agent, we would kill livestock, we would burn their villages to the ground. It's literally searching out the enemy and destroying anything that is going to keep us from it. Uh, of course, this is all kind of terrible. But in the moment, we felt like it was the best plan uh, for trying to defeat this threat of communism. Uh, met, over the course of many years, we're going to see that both of these approaches, the battle of attrition, the battle of hearts and minds, with all of these different, uh, uh, again, weapons and ideas, well, it's just going to make this war that much more complicated. Uh, once we get into it, it's hard to get out. Uh, and uh, it's something we'll continue to talk about over the coming days. So with that said and done, that's it for now. Okay. Uh, you can put your notebooks away. Uh, what we've got left to talk about uh, is work to be completed. Uh, so of course, you're going to have stuff every day, again, lectures, assignments, reminders, stuff like that. Please keep checking for those. Uh, you do have your first official unit five assignment, which is going to be an artist analysis, which I know most of you don't like, but it's a good way to engage with some material. Uh, when you go to classroom, you're going to see that the table is there. Uh, you're typing right into it like you have on some of the other ones uh, overall. And uh, you'll see also that there are options. You get to choose uh, all of the sources that are listed by page number, <clears throat> excuse me, on classroom uh, are coming from chapter 30. And they're all different, again, soldier experiences of fighting on the ground in Vietnam that I'd like you to take a look at. Uh, you just pick one and just choose one uh, and you can decide which one you're going to look at uh, overall your call. Uh, the other work to be completed, and I'm going to keep putting this out there every day until the due date, is your local history part two. Uh, keep an eye on Classroom for a how to start video really soon, and then some other ideas, um, tips and tricks, things like that. Uh, the final thing I want to just bring up to you guys, because you're going to see things get posted sooner rather than later, is that this is one of those moments. I mean, again, last unit, I could have done this too, because there's just so much cool stuff out there, but I particularly like the, again, I guess it just comes right down to it is this is a, a an era that Hollywood and TV and just people in general find really fascinating. So there's like a lot of really cool stuff out there. Uh, so I'm going to be posting like an enrichment section on your classroom page, which will have movies and documentaries, uh, books, things that if you are really fascinated by some of the stuff that we talk about, I might not be able to go into a lot of detail. So 
if you're looking for more info or you're just really curious, again, look it up. Again, I'll, everything that is um, visual, I'll probably put some kind of uh, reference to where you can find it. Uh, again, if it's a book, I hopefully it's on the classroom, um, again, virtual book site. If not, it would be something that you could maybe, <laughs> I don't know, get your hands on at some point. Uh, none of this is required. It's also not extra credit. So this is really just enrichment. It's for you if you're looking for something extra or if you're feeling kind of like, oh, well, this is kind of cool uh, and take a look at it. Uh, again, it'll all be really cool and interesting stuff. That's for sure. Uh, I hope you guys all have a good day.